Good evening, everybody. My name is Nate Shuda. I'm part of the advocacy team here at Pivotal. Best way to describe me is architect as a service, because of course everything is as a service these days. And the first time someone called me that, I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. That, that's a good, you know, pretty good description of my day-to-day -day life. And then I'll admit I sounded out the acronym, and I realized it may not have been actually meant as a compliment. I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. But we're here to talk about the cloud a little bit here this evening. And, and of course, as soon as you go down this, this journey, you realize, man, there's a lot of options here. And of course, in my experience, for so many developers, as soon as I say, let's go to the cloud, they think that must mean microservices. Cloud native, by definition, equals microservices. And I don't think that's true. Now, a lot of people are spending countless hours on domain-driven design. You know, that, that book is fantastic. And I think when it came out, a lot of us were like, this is really important, but we don't quite understand why yet. And it just took 20 years for us to see, you know, where it would be applicable in our day-to-day -day lives. So, you know, we're looking for these bounded contexts, and we're defining ubiquitous languages, and we're running around forming two pizza teams. And we sort of lost sight of that great quote from one of my favorite movies, your developers were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And so we're starting to see some serious pain come out of that. You know, and I'm already starting to hear some people talk about the microservices backlash and how microservices are legacy and oops, that was a mistake. And we do this all the time in this industry. It's one of my sort of soapbox issues, our constant need to kind of make the same mistakes of the past. We use a technology where it doesn't make sense and then we get really mad at the technology because we used it in a place that wasn't appropriate. But we look at microservices and we think, you know, having this big distributed ball of mud is somehow going to be better. And then we look at the call structure and we go, ouch, this hurts. You know, there's a reason these are called Death Star architectures. I think that's why the Death Stars keep blowing up, right? They have this critical flaw. You know, they, they used microservices. So that becomes a problem. And, and I do want to stress, there are many good reasons to adopt microservices. But there are no free lunches in our industry. I'm sorry. I had somebody ask me today, if I'm, a, if I'm at a startup, should I use microservices? And of course, the only answer I can give you is it depends. We, we need to have a conversation about does a microservice architecture help you solve the problems you're facing or not? So we need to look at the added complexity because make no bones about it, there is added complexity to this architecture. And then ask yourself, do I benefit from what microservices give me or have I just added a whole bunch of accidental complexity to my environment? And so this has been one of my soapboxes now for a while, and it's this whole no and sort of notion of when should we use microservices? And that sort of evolved into this, this blog series I wrote last year. It started as one, and then Jared just kept peppering me, and I had to write more and more. So you can find this out on our, our website, and, and at some point, I'm sure I'll convert that into one of these little ebook report things. But this, to me, is really what we should be striving for. Should that be a microservice? And it's a series of principles that we've used with clients to say, hey, this is when it makes sense. This is when maybe you should avoid them. All right, so I won't get through all of them today. We have a rather short amount of time together, and I'm not going to stand between you and receptions because I know there's adult beverages and food, and you know, we have more important things to do. So the first principle that we look at is multiple rates of change. So inevitably, when you look at your system, you're going to discover that some parts of it are changing all the time. Seemingly every day, we're in there messing with that file. And then others, man, I haven't touched it since that first commit. So if you find yourself in a situation where some parts of this system are evolving at radically different paces than others, guess what? Microservices might be useful for you. And so I wrote this little, you know, widget.io, everything's .io. And so it's this little guy here, you know, kind of standard website-y kind of e-commerce thing. You know, you got a recommendation engine and some order processing and inventory, et cetera. You know, the reality with an architecture like this, there's a pretty good chance our cart's not changing much. You know, it is what it is. You add things to the cart, you take things out of the cart, you know, maybe you update how we calculate tax or shipping or something. And, you know, the inventory system, we probably don't have a lot of control over that because it's probably tied into some ancient warehousing thing. But, you know, the product owners always want the recommendation engine to be better. And I've yet to have a customer come to me and say, search is just too good. Please make search worse. Now, if I'm in a monolith, I'm stuck. Everything has to move at the same rate, the same pace. And that's ultimately, I think, why we were in this quarterly release cycle. Because we looked at it and we said, well, we got to mush everything out at once. We might as well wait till we've batched up a whole bunch of changes. And once all of them are ready, we'll go ahead and push those out because, well, you got to push the whole thing anyway, so you might as well. Now, now, here's the great irony of that to me. We've always looked at that and said somehow that this is less risky. How's that possible? 
I mean, every one of you has been locked in a windowless conference room at some ungodly hour of the day or night trying to figure out which of the 3,987 changes that went into this release caused the problem. If we have one change and we push it to production and there's a problem, I don't think it's going to take us that long to figure out which change caused the problem. You know, root cause analysis seems like it's going to be a little simpler than if we have three months or six months worth of work batched up here. Now, luckily for us, we have options today. I can actually split things apart. And so I can separate out the things that I want to iterate faster. So I may look at this and say, OK, my recommendation engine, I'm going to pull that out. Search, I'm going to pull that out. And now I can turn around and deliver business value quickly. Now, of course, your first question here should be, well, how do I know what changes more frequently than others? Well, trust your instincts. There's a pretty good chance you already have some ideas in your system about what moves more quickly than others. So, so listen to your gut. But that said, having some data can be very, very useful. So don't be afraid to start with your source code management tool of choice. There's a pretty good chance you can get a decent heat map just by looking at the history of the changes and the commits that have happened to your system. So you can run a command kind of like this. I assume many of you are using git these days. And it'll actually tell you kind of what your top 10 problem children might be. And I ran that against Spring just for fun. Now, not a monolith, obviously, but it's a teaching example. And I came up with something like this. Now, a few of these, oh, the build changed. Oh, the index changed. The change log changed. Ooh, no one could have predicted this. Now, in fairness, I don't know Spring deeply enough to know if any of these interesting ones here, like the bean factory and the configuration support, <laughs> does it matter that they're changing a lot? I don't know. But it at least gives us a place to start. It gives us something to talk about. And now we have to practice what many of us have spent a shocking amount of our career doing, and that's software archaeology. How many of you have ever been on a rewrite and someone says to you, hey, what are the requirements? And, and it's, it's got to work like the old system, only better. And of course, step one is, what would you say the old system does? So we've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to dig around in the code base and try to figure out what's going on. And, and to paraphrase Sir Isaac Newton, we're looking for smoother pebbles and prettier shells, or what Michael Feathers would call churn. Now, in Michael's case, he used this as a way of indicating, like, where should we refactor? And so it's a similar kind of thing for what we're trying to do here. And there's almost guarantee that when you look at your project, there's going to be a long tail distribution. You're going to have a set of files that are updated constantly, and then a whole bunch that have this sort of descending level of hardly being touched at all. Now, interestingly enough, Chad Fowler created a tool based on this. He, he called this thing turbulence, which was churn versus complexity, which is sort of saying, hey, the things that are churning a lot and are complex are probably good candidates for refactoring. Imagine that. Now, there are some interesting code forensic tools that you might want to leverage as well. I have no stake in this fight. I've not used them in anger, but I did run into code scene when I was poking around one day, and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. You know, it sort of gives you this overview of, of your code base, and you can drill into all sorts of things, and you start to get this sense of, like, what's actually happening here? And the colors kind of give you an indicator that, hey, there might be something going on that I might want to look at. And you start digging into it, and you look, and you go, wow. There's been quite a few commits on this particular file, hasn't there? And it's got kind of this weird grading and other things that you, know, you want to take with a grain of salt. But then there's this interesting little com complexity trend. You know, Things are getting worse and then better and worse than better. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there was some refactoring work that must have happened in there. We also get some cyclomatic complexity numbers out of this. That's a really fascinating thing to look at, by the way. Cyclomatic complexity is just how many paths through my code base. Small, single-digit numbers are good. As soon as you get into high single-digit numbers and, God forbid, double-digit numbers, that's when you start trying to extricate yourself from that project. The worst I've ever seen in anger, I was, I was on one project where we had some issues, I guess would be the polite way to put it, and I, I ran cyclomatic complexity against it, and we had a function whose cyclomatic complexity was 82. I still, to life me, do not know how a developer sat down and created a function like that, but someone did, actually a set of someone's. We also get some interesting graphs, and we can start to get some ideas on what's going on in this particular chunk of code. And you start to get some ideas, too, on you know, where we might have more churn than others. And you also get an interesting view into who's working on what. You know, We have a tendency in a lot of our code bases to have single-person dependencies, so code that either has a, a low bus number or, if you want to be more positive, a low lottery number. You know, so I, I worked at one company once. We, we had some interesting issues. I'm a Minnesotan, so interesting is a very blanket term to cover all sorts of phrases. But there is this one part of the code that we were in this meeting one day, and we we're talking about it, and someone said, oh, no, only Jeff goes into that part of the code base. It's strong with the dark side of the force. 
And I just thought, that's a problem. If we have a chunk of code that like, literally only one developer feels like they can go in there. And as much as as a developer, you might want to be that single person that everybody has to rely on, it's not a great place to be, honestly. Because try going on vacation and see what happens. And of course, eventually some manager comes in and decides, ah, the way I'm gonna make my mark around here is removing single person dependencies. And a lot of times after that, they remove the single person that was a single person dependency. Now, I'm not trying to shill for this. I don't know, again, I've never used this in anger. I just thought it was kind of fascinating when I was doing some research. You know, so again, you can look at your source code management tool. I mean, again, Git will give you a lot of information as will GitHub, you know, so you can start to get a sense pretty quickly. You know, if the last commit on this file coincided with one of those super blue blood moon eclipse things, that's probably not a good candidate. If I find one of those, those areas that's always changing, okay, let's dig a little deeper. Now you can look at your defect tracker. You know, wh where's my bug density? Look at your backlog. What do my customers keep wanting me to make changes? Now, we got some candidates, that's good, that's a win, but what do we do now? I mean, we could try the big bang refactoring and see how that works out for us, but really the best way to go is to leverage the strangler pattern. You know, so this is something that Martin talked about a long time ago, a long time ago, this has been out almost 20 years now, I think, if I got my math right. And, and he sort of came upon this idea while wandering around, I think in Australia, and saw this vine that was like eating this tree from the outside. And, and to me, this is a great way of approaching these kinds of problems. And it's a lot less risky than trying to do the Big Bang refactoring. And I've been on Big Bang refactoring. There, there's, it's not a lot of fun in many cases. You know, you spend 18 months and your customer keeps asking how it's going and you're like, well, we're 80% done, don't worry. You know, give us another three or four years and we'll get that last 20% done for you. And, and so uh, Martin came out with this idea, this Strangler application, and, and essentially what he's arguing for is don't try to replace the whole thing at once. In, you know, build the new around the edges of the old, gradually replacing the old until next thing you know, all we have is the new. Or we've sort of, you know, walled off the old. That dramatically reduces the risk because we're going bit by bit by bit. And most importantly, and where I think this gets a lot of its value, is I am delivering things incrementally. I am showing progress. I'm getting feedback. Now, we can go a step further, and we can apply data to this. Because here's the reality. If you've ever worked with an old system, and you've looked at like a pricing algorithm, and you've asked a really obvious question, which is, what does the pricing algorithm do? In many cases, the only answer we can legitimately give is, I'm not exactly sure. We give it some inputs, we get some outputs, we all hope it's right. There's a pretty good chance that we don't understand all the nuance. There is an almost guarantee that we never bothered to write down all those interesting edge cases and all those patches and all those things we fixed over the course of five or 10 or 15 years. Which means when we try to replace it, we don't know about that strange thing that only happens like once every seven years. This happened to me once. I, I, was, I was worked on this one project for a few months and then we handed it off to the team for them to maintain it. And I don't know, probably three months later, my director comes over to me and says, hey, you worked on the, the Wombat app, right? And I'm like, uh-huh. He's like, they had a build break this morning. Do you think you could help them? I'm like, well, sure, but they should just look at their last commit. And he said, well, that's the thing. They haven't actually changed anything in a couple days. They're not sure why the build broke. I'm like, well, that is interesting. And so I looked into it and I noticed one of the tests failed. And so I looked at the test and I realized, oh, this test is going to fail every seven years. Oops. And I wrote it, so you know, it's my own damn fault, I guess. And for the life of me, I can't remember if I actually fixed it or just said, this will fail again in seven years. I don't know. <laughs> but the reality is we find all these edge cases that we don't know existed because we fixed it. So we moved on to the next fire, fire drill, the next crisis. And so now we're sitting here going, if I'm trying to replace this algorithm, I don't know if I'm doing it right. What if we had data? And so that's this idea of the data-driven strangler, which was something I was actually talked about at a spring one uh, at least two or three years ago. I can't remember the exact, um, exact <coughs> issue that that one happened at. But the general idea here is we put a proxy layer in between the client and the old system, and we log the results. So we let the client keep calling, we log out, here is the request, here is the response, and now we know what the old system does, which means I can write some test cases. So it looks a little something like this. Now we can start building the new thing, and we can actually run them both in parallel. And I can run requests to both of them, and I compare the results. If they match, we're in a good place, awesome, return that result. If they don't, well let's trust the old system for the time being, but let's log that out and have a human being take a look at it and figure out what is good and what is bad. And by the way, there's a pretty good chance your old system's wrong. 
I mean, it's shocking how often that happens, to be real honest with you, because there's some weird edge case or there's some weird situation we didn't know it worked like that. And one of the next principles I'd urge you to look at is independent life cycles. I've worked on a lot of monoliths, and if you've ever been in that system, which I assume all of you have at some point in your career, you know, they don't just shift on a dime. They don't just turn on a dime. That doesn't work very well today. You know, when I first got into this industry, it was very easy to say, that'll take two years. And they're like, mm, okay, this takes two years. We can't do that anymore. Things are changing too rapidly. We need to adopt that always be changing mindset. We need to be able to run experiments. We need to be able to do A-B testing. Our customers are coming to us with changes all the time because they're getting pressure to change all the time because the pace of change has ramped up considerably. We can no longer say that'll take three years. We gotta turn things around in days or months, not, not months or years. So at, at Spring One a couple years ago, Someone got up and was, was talking, one of the gentlemen from Scotiabank was talking about their journey from doing the traditional quarterly releases to thousands of releases. And, and I was really impressed by that because if you think about financial services, that's one of those industries that tends to move slowly. And so a bunch of my former, for, former coworkers were at that event and we were talking about it and they said, Nate, you know we'll never be able to do that. You've worked with us, you know the pressures we face. I said, yeah, I understand that, but we don't really have a choice now. We have to be able to move quickly. We have to be able to respond to these changes in the business because speed matters. And I hate to say it, you know, and I know this is sort of like buzzword bingo, but disruption is affecting all of us. Nobody's immune from this. You know, so if we look at our widget.io, what if our business comes along and says, hey, I've got a new opportunity. I've got something that would be fantastic in the marketplace, but I need you guys to turn this around in a couple of weeks. I can't wait for the next quarterly release. That's just not gonna cut it anymore. So we might build that as its own standalone microservice. And so now that's independent from everybody else. It might even have its own repo. It's got its own build pipeline. It has its own life cycle. Now that obviously gives us speed to market. That's a huge win. However, it also gives us developer productivity. If you've ever been on a monolith, you're familiar with the 87 page getting started guide. And every single one of these I've ever been a part of, there's somewhere in there that basically says, and now go talk to Kathy. I was that person on a project for about three years. I was, I was on the project in the beginning and then I left it. And so for like three years, I kept getting calls like, hey, um, I just rolled onto the Wombat project and it says I'm supposed to call you. And I'm like, okay, yeah, fine. I'll help you finish the setup. You know, and finally, one of my friends rolled onto the project and he called me, he's like, why am I calling you? I'm like, I don't know. I can't update that wiki anymore. You guys took away my rights as soon as I left the project. He's like, all right, I'll fix it for you. And then I finally you know, got, got myself out of being you know, the person everybody called. I was on one project once where, <clears throat> and I, I really am not proud to say this, uh, builds took 24 plus hours. So you made a commit and then you just hoped it all worked because by the time there was a build break, it was gonna be two days later and you're like, uh, I don't remember what I was working on. In those situations, it's really hard to get up to speed. It takes you a long time. And that same organization, the sort of general wisdom was it was about a year before you were productive in the code base. That's not great for anybody. It's not great for us as an employer. It's not great for, for us as an employee. You know, that's not a great place to be. Whereas if I've got something smaller, if I've got 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 lines of code, I can get my head wrapped around that. Builds can be quick. If there's a build break, we can fix it. It can be much easier to test. I don't have to have these 80 hour manual regression suites. I was, I was on this project one day and I, I made this comment about we should do this and my QA lead just glared at me. And I'm like, you have a comment? And she said, you can't make that change because if you do that means I have to do an 80 hour manual regression test. I'm like, oh, okay, scratch that idea. We'll try something else. So I can have a set of fine grained tests that run every time we have a commit. I don't have to do performances that one off we do just before production and then ignore the results. I can use the right tools for the job. If you're on this shared life cycle, you are at the mercy of whomever the slowest moving creature is. We're at that point where I have to wait for the, the slowest moving app, this one size fits all infrastructure. You've all been in a situation where you have desperately wanted to move up to the next version of Java and been told, no, I'm sorry, you can't have nice things because that app isn't ready yet. Don't worry, they'll be ready in 2024 for Java 1.6. Every microservice can do the right set of tests that make sense for them. They can use the right linting rules, the right code quality rules. It can be so much easier to find fitness functions. I can actually perform hypothesis-driven development. I wish I could predict the future. That'd be awesome. 
Although in fairness, I would use it to make stock picks and bet on sporting events. That would be far more profitable than guessing where your project is going. Every one of us has been in the project room and had a debate about this solution will increase sales or increase conversions or signups. You know, and you're very confident in your opinion, but, but how do you know? And of course, more importantly, what happens if you're wrong? If you're at the monolith, by definition, we had to be conservative. We had to move slowly. Now we can be more aggressive. We can be bold. We can try things. We can actually do A-B testing. We can put 10% of our, of our traffic on this new thing and see what actually happens. I can do something like this. We believe this change will result in this outcome. We will know we have succeeded when we see this metric change. We believe adding a distributed cash will result in faster startup times. We'll know if we're right if startup times are lower than 15 seconds. This might morph its way into some really useful fitness functions. Now, for many of us, for a long time, we've looked at the tech giants like Amazon and Google and went, oh man, I wish I could do A-B testing like them. You can now. And let's be honest, every one of your customers would love it if your product was constantly improving. You know, if anybody finds the customer that says, hey, the product's too good, please stop doing that. Wow. Now, the challenge here, though, is for us to get this to work, we have to use paved roads. You know, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of microservices. For so many of us, microservices basically is the excuse to finally use that language technology database we've always been dying to use. Oh, thank God, I finally have an excuse to use insert technology here because microservices. The reality is we have to have paved roads. That's really what's happening, even at these, these companies with the deeply embedded developer autonomy. Here is a well-worn path. We know how it works. We know how to support it. If you choose to go on the minimum maintenance road, you're on your own. You build it. You own it. This is the part of microservices that people forget sometimes. Yeah, you get to make more of these choices. You have more autonomy. You also have a lot more accountability, a lot more responsibility. You know, think about how you get good at something. If you only do something once or twice a year, you're never going to get good at it. It has to, it, it requires reps. It requires practice. You know, think about tying your shoes. Everyone in this room knows how to tie their shoes. You've done it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. If I asked you, asked you how to do it, you just do like some motion with your hands. You don't know how to describe it. There was a time in your life where you couldn't do that. We need to deploy early. We need to deploy often. This is one of those rare times where if it hurts, you should do it more because that's how you will improve. That's how you will remove friction from the system. You need to have a process that you trust. We need robust pipelines with Concourse or Visual Studio or Jenkins or any of these things. Now, if you're not sure how to create a pipeline, don't worry, we can help. The Spring folks have come up with an opinionated build, test, stage, prod flow. It's a place to start. It's not trying to own your build or anything like that. But I am very much of the opinion independent life cycles is one of the most underappreciated benefits of microservices. One of the most dangerous phrases that you hear in an organization is, that's how we've always done it. This is death right here. This cannot be the reason we continue to do something. Now, of course, for many of us, as soon as we talk about microservices, we talk about scaling. The monolith forced us to make a whole bunch of decisions very, very early on in the process, often when we knew the least. So what was one of the most common questions you would get asked by your operations people when you were starting a project? How much capacity do you think you're going to need? The only answer we could give them was, I'm not really sure. And so what would we do? We'd take a total swag. We'd take our worst case. We'd double it. We'd add a little more, maybe double it again, just in case. Because the reality is, it takes so long to get capacity. The lead times on this, while they might have quoted you in days or weeks, were really months. It involved tickets upon tickets upon tickets. This is the one thing about enterprise IT I do not miss. Well, this is one of, I should say. I'm convinced that a ticketing system is designed to make sure you can't possibly succeed. Really and truly. It, it's, it's one of those things where, oh my god, how did you get to the end? You weren't supposed to be able to win. <laughs> the only way you can get a ticket to clear is if you find someone who somehow managed to get one through and say, hey, can I look at that ticket? And then you copy it and you modify it. And then you got to go to a bunch of meetings, and you got to exchange a bunch of email, and then there's more meetings and more follow-up. And so it put us in a situation where it was in our best interest to heavily over-allocate our resources because it's better to have it and not need it than need it and then have to go get it later. 
which meant for most of us, we're talking single-digit server utilization. Now, the reality is our traffic's not predictable. I mean, I've had some people argue with me that, oh, you know, our, our traffic is super predictable. We know when things are going to happen. Yeah, that's not the way the world works anymore. You know, the reality is this unexpected demand comes out of the blue. And, and while I can certainly plan for the big new sales initiative or something like that, in today's world, for better or worse, a social media influencer says, I love your product. And next thing you know, your traffic goes up 10x. Now, of course, I always look at life from an application standpoint, because I'm a developer at heart. But I, operations staff had a whole bunch of stuff to deal with here, too. The annual budgeting process did not make it easy for them to smoothly add capacity. But of course, today, cloud environments and microservices flip that script because I can add and remove capacity on demand. I don't have to make these decisions immediately when I know the least. I can wait for the last responsible moment instead of swaggies and guesses. Now, the monolith suffered from these issues because there was no way for me to just scale part of it. It was all or nothing, which meant that I'm heavily over allocated. So if I go back to my widget I.O. example, there's a pretty good chance that this order processing system scales differently than the rest of the system. It'd sure be nice if I could do that as needed and then scale it back down when I didn't. With a microservices approach, I can actually fully utilize my compute. But now that does lead us to another interesting question, which is, so how would you say you're going to figure out what needs the capacity? Well, you better have good, robust monitoring in place. Of course, to be honest, if you're doing microservices, you better have a thriving, a thriving monitoring system as well. That's the only way this works. That's one of the, the core tenets of site reliability engineering. I can't recommend this book enough. You do not need to read this cover to cover, by the way. This is a bunch of essays. You can sort of you know, read one, put it down, read one, put it down. You don't have to read it in order. You know, whatever's interesting to you, go read it. But one of the things they talk about in this book are the four golden signals. So latency, how long does it take for me to service a request? What's my traffic level look like? What's my error rate right now? This could be implicit, explicit, a policy failure. Are my resources saturated? Now, one of the challenges we face here is we need to know what our sampling frequency should be. This is not obvious day one. You're not going to know this a priori. You're going to need to work at this. This is why having a site reliability engineering team can be so valuable, because they've done this on multiple projects. They have a sense of what works and what doesn't. High resolution isn't always the best idea. I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, a musician came out with a sort of challenger to the, the Apple iTunes ecosystem that had a much higher bit rate. And he was talking about, how, oh, it's so much warmer. You know, and people who actually understand how the human ear work are like, ha ha, that's not true. You know, so high frequency isn't necessarily better. It might be more beneficial for us to aggregate up all this data. And there's a whole bunch of tools in this space. But don't be afraid to just use what Spring Boot Actuator gives you. There's a lot of fascinating stuff right there at your disposal. Take advantage of it. This isn't easy. This takes time. Adjust, adapt, try it out. Don't be afraid to have an SRE team. Now, one of the challenges you're going to run into here is inevitably you're going to have that metric that, hey, that's easy to measure. Well, let's measure that. I'm sorry, it might not actually help. Lines of code, anyone. One of the other big challenges we have to have is we need to understand the business drivers here. We need to understand what changes on the business side might cause a huge spike in demand. And more importantly, how does that translate to all of our services? Now, I strongly advise you to be realistic here. So many people will tell you, oh my god, we're going to have a billion customers on day one. Probably not. I hope for you, you all have massive success. But we're going to grow to that in almost all situations. So no, we can't all be a third of internet traffic. So independent scalability is awesome if you need it. And for a lot of us, it actually is pretty darn useful, to be fair. All right, so I'm just about out of time, because that's how this works. OK. So I love microservices. They're great. But you have to weigh the pros and cons. With great power comes great responsibility. Do not forget. Huge central tenant here is you build it, you run it. You must avoid resume-driven design. <laughs> Please. Now, there are some serious benefits here. They all come at a price. Do not pay that complexity tax unless you are getting something in return. So no, not everything needs to be a microservice. Use them where they make sense. Use them where they add value. If you need one or more of these principles, awesome. Go forth and prosper. If not, don't worry, there's always serverless. 
Thank you, folks, very much. I appreciate your time and attention. Cheers.